All right, it looks like we have our, our next speaker lined up here. Um, so our next session is <clears throat> how Bitcoin gains adoption. Uh, so I'd like to welcome to the stage, Dan Held. Uh, Dan is currently the director of growth at Kraken. His former company, Interchange, a portfolio reconciliation tool for crypto institutional traders, was acquired by Kraken in 2019. Prior to that, he was at Uber on Rider Growth Global Data. Before Uber, Dan built some of the most popular early crypto products, including ChangeTip, acquired by Airbnb, and ZeroBlock, acquired by Blockchain.com. He was part of the original 2013 crypto meetup group in San Francisco, which comprised with the founders of Kraken, Coinbase, Litecoin, and others. Welcome, Dan. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Looks All right. Fun. So you, everyone already got a little bit of background on me. I've been in crypto for a long time. Um, I've seen the ebb and flows of different market cycles, and it's been super interesting to look at Bitcoin go from a very, very tiny kind of niche community to basically run the verge of mainstream adoption. And, you know, I've gone through the exercise of thinking, well, how does Bitcoin gain adoption? Well, maybe we go get merchants to accept Bitcoin at their uh, different stores, or we go, um, you know, put Bitcoin in, in someone's wallet and have them hold it and, and gift someone Bitcoin. But there's actually a fundamental viral loop that's built into Bitcoin, which is really, really cool. So a viral loop stands for, uh, you know, for those who are marketers, you've probably heard of this before, but essentially a viral loop is uh, like, say I take Uber, for example, and then after taking a ride in an Uber, I then share the app via a link with my friends. They try Uber for the first time, they like it, and then they go, <clears throat> maybe I should share it with my friends. That's the viral loop. So each individual is infecting or, or influencing others to uh, hear about a product or service and then get into it. Um, and this can happen in a variety of different ways. You know, a viral loop could be built into uh, content. For example, Pinterest. And with Pinterest, you create content. That content now is searchable via uh, Google indexing. So once Google indexes it, uh, this, when you perform a query like uh, cute baby photos, then these Pinterest uh, folders or these pins, I forget exactly what they are. I don't use Pinterest. They show up. Uh, so that's what a traditional viral loop looks like. Now, a Bitcoin viral loop is really interesting and it all has to do with the price. So most of us heard about Bitcoin in 2013, 2017 or now uh, as the price increased all of our friends and family came out and either talked to us about it. And that's how we learned about it. And, you know, once we went through, and if you've already been a Bitcoiner for a little while, you become the prophesizer of, Hey, I think Bitcoin's is great, uh, great uh, uh, solution to the central banking and, and fiat problem in the world. And that's usually done through word of mouth. So Bitcoin's viral loop all has to do with the price first, starting with the price going up. So price goes up, people become more aware of it. And then people learn about it. They buy Bitcoin, then they tell all their friends and family about it. And so that's the viral loop that Bitcoin has baked in naturally into it just based on price movement or volatility. Um, if Bitcoin's price had stayed at $100, $1,000, none of us would be here. Uh, we are here because of these intensely volatile cycles. And that is Bitcoin's viral loop. It's my main marketing channel to bring in new users into Bitcoin. There's also a saying, come for the speculation, stay for the sound money. And a lot of folks do that too, where Bitcoin drew them in just based purely on speculation. And they didn't learn about it. And then they started to learn about it because they owned it. So something really cool here that we see is a statement by Satoshi back in 20, I think it was like 2010. So Satoshi says, in this sense, it's more typical, he's talking about Bitcoin, of a precious metal. Instead of the supply changing to keep the value the same, the supply is predetermined and the value changes. As the number of users grows, the, the value per coin increases. It has the potential for a positive feedback loop, aka viral loop. As users increase, the value goes up, which could attract more users to take advantage of the increasing value. Satoshi's talking about FOMO here, and he's talking about this viral loop that I just, <clears throat> just uh, brought into this conversation. Note that he said this before Bitcoin was worth anything. He hypothesized this would happen. And for money, price equals utility. As the price climbs, Bitcoin becomes more liquid, which allows more market participants to come in. Um, and this is Bitcoin's virtuous uh, viral loop cycle of adoption. And in this chart, we can see Bitcoin's inflation rate, which is the color blue. And sorry for the very thin lines. Hopefully this shows up in the presentation. 
the blue is Bitcoin's inflation rate or issuance rate of new coins. And the halvings are the dotted lines and Bitcoin's price is the white line going from the bottom left to the upper right. As we can see, a bull run has occurred post every single halving. It is hypothesized that these halvings, that, that these halvings are induced by, or these cycles are induced by halvings. The idea being that a reduction in supply plus an increase or demand staying the same number goes up. What's really unique about Bitcoin versus any other asset is that as Bitcoin's price increases, there's no supply response. If the price of gold went to $10,000 tomorrow, miners would dig deeper and deeper into the earth to find gold and they would expend more proof of work. With Bitcoin, the exact number of Bitcoin that we, you know, with a very high precision, we know how many coins will be issued over the next X, Y, Z amount of days. Um, because of that, it makes Bitcoin's volatility very intense. As demand increases, there's no additional creation of supply. Supply is on this predetermined curve. And what we see happen in these cycles is that this is the core drive, this price going up is the core driving mechanism behind a lot of adoption metrics. So one, a popular adoption, adoption metric is new users. This is Coinbase's new users over time. And we can see, you know, 2017, 2013 was so long ago and in such a smaller market that we can barely see it on this chart. But 2017, we can see that bend in the growth, you know, where that intense period of growth happens during these bull runs. Um, and then now we're starting to see that bend again in their, in their user curve. So across all crypto products, we see this. Uh, I work at Kraken, we see the same sort of charts. As, the, as Bitcoin's price increases, people come in. And Bitcoin and Coinbase have been around for the 13, 17 and this cycle. So you know, at this point, this is more of a, it's a repeatable, it's a repeat behavior that we can observe in the market. That's all driven by FOMO or basic human, basic human greed, which isn't a bad or good thing. It's just humans will want to accumulate as much value as possible. And they're drawn to the speculation of Bitcoin. Now, not only do new users increase when the price increases, but so does funding. So funding in this space is, a, uh, this was an, a little bit of an older chart, so I don't have updated information, but I just popped it in here for visualization purposes. As the price increases, more users pile in and companies make more money and VCs want to fund more endeavors. This means that as the price increases, there are more wallets, exchanges, um, literally every product or service that would, surf it, that would be needed for a Bitcoiner and for a Bitcoiner along a spectrum of technical expert expertise. Early Bitcoiners are much more technical, able to grok more complex concepts. Tech uh, and great UX UI have obfuscated some of that technicalities, some of those technicalities and allowed more and more participants to come in like your parents or grandparents. So with funding, you know, this is directly correlated with uh, these cycles as well. It's huge. I mean, the amount of funding that we've seen recently is enormous and would dwarf 2019. So. Um, you know, in a couple of years, we'll look at this chart in 2019, you know, 2018, 2017 will look tiny compared to 2021, 2022. Um, Bitcoin's price is the sole driver of both users and funding. And then liquidity as well. So this is uh, pulled, this was pulled from, um, oh, I forget which, I'll, I'll, I'll pop in the source afterwards. Um, but, um, oh, it's from Bitcoinity. So this is a Bitcoinity chart of all uh, exchange volume. And as we see, as the price rises, the, uh, the orange line, um, volume increases as well. So volume means that more and more participants can get in, out, in and out of the market. Volume is a directional indicator of liquidity and liquidity allows big institutions to come in as we've seen very recently with all the top investment banks, hedge funds, companies, uh, eventually we'll see sovereign wealth funds and central banks. Those last two require Bitcoin to be really liquid. Some of these, like for example, sovereign wealth funds, won't even invest in an asset unless it has a trillion dollar market cap or trillion dollar size. So as Bitcoin's price rises, so does volume, so do more and more participants who can come in. And this leads to a flywheel effect. As more people come in, then more participants then can be enabled to come in and also manage the risk in terms of their position. And this again is all part of Bitcoin's price increase. And then finally, we have Bitcoin core development. So Bitcoin core development, this is a representation of code commits for Bitcoin over time. As Bitcoin's price is increased, so as developer activity and review of Bitcoin's core code, making it more secure longer term. And we're seeing a really cool trend with Bitcoin core development sponsored by countries uh, or patrons of Bitcoin core development. And that's dramatically increased over the years as well. Whereas like the early Bitcoin code was, was little, not as reviewed as it is now and there were less participants. In the future with the 2021 20, cycle, 2022, 
we might see hundreds of companies sponsor developers. And this would be amazing because that means more people reviewing the code, more tooling built, better improvements to the protocol. Now, Bitcoin is very uh, against any dramatic changes, but maybe improvements that could make it more resilient or, or small efficiencies. So again, Bitcoin's price is that core viral loop that drives all of this adoption across the board. And then finally, Bitcoin's adopt, Bitcoin's price increase also, inc also is great for its security model. So for those unfamiliar, the way that the game theory works, miners expend upfront energy. So both energy and the ASICs, the special machines that they bought to mine Bitcoin. For that effort, they receive a portion of the block reward, which is based on you know, over time, that's based on X percentage of the hash rate that they that they uh, bring to the network. The block reward is an incentivization mechanism to incentivize miners to behave properly. The miners have spent this upfront proof of work. The Bitcoin protocol essentially is rewarding the miners for expending that work. And by expending that work, they are ordering transactions in a proper way, AKA they're not doing a reorganization or a 51% attack. If they did, it would damage their future cash flows. They've already spent all this money for these machines. And the block reward is the compensation for spending that money. If they were to try to fiddle with the ordering of transactions, AKA a 51% attack or reorg, um, that would damage their future cash flows, AKA the block reward. So there's a concern that over time that Bitcoin's block reward, which is comprised of newly minted Bitcoin and transaction fees, there's a worry that uh, as the subsidy decreases because less and less Bitcoins are being created, or, you know, there's the 21 million hard cap and we have a logarithmic curve of issuance and that, that's starting to hit that, that's sort of very like declining slope. Um, th there's a worry that transaction fees won't compensate to replace the subsidy in the block reward, thereby reducing the amount of compensation of miners. However, this is overblown. And this chart proves that we can add uh, percent miner revenue from fees. <clears throat> and as we can see in 2013, 2017, and now, as Bitcoin rises in price as people become more aware of it, people pile in and people will need to move Bitcoin on chain for various reasons. Even if Bitcoin is not the medium of exchange, which you know I think it's a better store of value, people still need to move it for large value transactions between their uh, custodial account to their non-custodial wallet. And what we're seeing is that the bidding pressure to get into a Bitcoin block increases, which increases the transaction fees, which will then replace the subsidy, thereby mitigating any future concern over the, um, over the declining value of the subsidy. So what this means is that Bitcoin security long term is predicated on adoption increasing, on Bitcoin becoming more and more prevalent in this world by more and more people believing in Bitcoin. And so this chart is direct evidence of that. And without adoption, Bitcoin and almost every other blockchain would have long-term security issues if there wasn't, uh, you know, increases in adoption over time. So, you know, all of this points to, <laughs> to price equals utility equals adoption. I've heard many times in the space, the price doesn't matter. Actually, the price is the only thing that matters. If the price was $10 or $100, none of us would be here. You wouldn't be here listening to me. You certainly wouldn't have bought Bitcoin. It's all tied together. This marketing viral loop is tied together and inherent to the success, security, and other factors with the protocol. So pr again, price equals utility equals adoption. It's the singular, price is the singular function that enables Bitcoin to grow. And it grows across user adoption, liquidity, funding, and security. Um, and that, that wraps up the end of my talk and I'd be happy to take some questions. Great, thank you, Dan. Um, we do have a few audience questions for you. So uh, first we have, when do you expect countries to start using Bitcoin as a reserve asset? What kind of countries do you think would be the ones to make the first move? Great question. I uh, certainly look forward to the day when <clears throat> a country announces that they've put some of their reserves in Bitcoin. My guess would be not the United States or the UK. Uh, it would probably be a country like Russia, China, um, maybe some smaller European country. Now, I know that Europe, Europe has ECB, but uh, I do know that, like for example, Germany still holds gold um, in their reserves. So I could see a, a, like a small European country, maybe Eastern European. I could see China, um, China, you know, Korea or Russia, uh, one of those countries putting Bitcoin in the reserve. I think, you know, probably before that, there might be some really minuscule, tiny country somewhere, right? <laughs> some, some country with like a million, like a million, uh, you know, a population of a million or something like that. But I'm not sure if I would count those as like material, um, like a material decision uh, because the country would be so small. 
All right, uh, up next, suppose Bitcoin plays a role, uh, or sorry, suppose Bitcoin plays just the role of a global reserve asset. Do you think that traditional financial systems, uh, sorry, do you think the traditional financial system will build several financial instruments on top of it, repeating the exact same history as gold? Yeah, so, um, you know, it's funny, I think there's, this is like a two part question. So one is like, uh, this is kind of tackling like Bitcoin's TAM or total bull addressable market going is Bitcoin just, you know, the word just is it just a store of value? Well, store of value is the number one TAM in the world. It's worth hundreds of trillions of dollars because that's people park this amount of value in gold, bonds, uh, real estate, etc. And Bitcoin is a contender or competitor with all of those other stores of value and it has unique properties compared to those. Especially, I mean, first and foremost, it's Caesarship resistance. <laughs> it's the only asset you truly hold because you it's a bearer asset. Uh, that in gold, right? So um, first and foremost, Bitcoin's TAM that it is tackling. So what is Bitcoin's problem? What problem is it's trying to solve? It's trying to solve the biggest problem in the world, which is storing value. So if it just does that, that's an incredible achievement. Um, it is the best achievement you could ever hope of any protocol or product ever in human history. Now people go, well, there'd be cool. What if we could do cool things with it like DeFi or, or other things, right? And I think that's the second part of this question, which is asking like, if Bitcoin doesn't add these to its functionality, you know, will there be innovation elsewhere? Or what does that mean? So I'm a product guy. So I think about like, how do we execute and how does Bitcoin execute and succeed? If you try to tinker with it, and this is the number one problem with startups is you get distracted and you might go build a feature that is shiny and cool for a short period of time, or you hypothesize might have product market fit. And then you've spent all this time and energy doing that. And then you've undermined the core reason why your product is valuable in the first place, because you weren't able to treat, or you weren't able to focus on that and execute on that. So Bitcoin, 99% of it's focused on store of value. And by being store of value, that means that not a lot of changes have to happen. If very few changes happen to Bitcoin, we develop more and more trust with it over time because it becomes unchanging and solidified and trustworthy. Time builds trust. I think that's what fundamentally most people don't grok in this space. You, I don't give a shit how you configure any XYZ protocol or code you use or encryption techniques you use. Humans are humans and they only build trust with software or physical things or anything else over time. So I don't care what sort of system you build that you hypothesize is better than Bitcoin. You'll still take a lot of time to develop that trust. For example, like proof of work is time tested and trusted. Proof of stake, while interesting, is is, is less tested and less trustworthy just due to time alone. Um, and so when we look at Bitcoins, like what is Bitcoin focusing on? It's just focus on store of value. Can Bitcoin do some of the other, do some things that these other, uh, uh, these other uh, protocols can do? Yes, it can do it in a, a more primitive, primitive sense or a little bit like clunkier sense. I don't think that's a big deal for Bitcoin long-term. I don't think that's anything that, uh, you know, sort of thwarts its success as a store of value. Some people will claim, well, you know, Ethereum is more usable. Look at all the things I can do with it. Well, yeah, aluminum is more usable, but we use gold as a store of value. Like, yeah, aluminum is super, at, like is used in all sorts of products and services, but that utility of the metal doesn't mean much in terms of its utility as a money. So, um, you know, I don't think it's TLDR. I don't think it's damaging for, I don't think it's will hurt Bitcoin. Um, you know, Bitcoin can do a lot of things to incorporate some of that. Now, of course, that might take a really long time and it may not be as interesting or easy to use as protocols like Ethereum, um, but I'm not worried about that being detrimental to Bitcoin's long-term success. So, so looking towards uh, 2021, what are some of the top goals and targets for, for Bitcoin and for Kraken? Yeah, um, so for 2021 for Kraken, I would say scaling, scaling, scaling. You know, we saw signups earlier this year, 10X in a couple of weeks, which is just crazy to see. I mean, I've worked at growth teams at Uber, which Uber was a very, and this was 2016 when Uber was kind of conquering the world. I've seen high growth, but this is just insane. Like really awesome to see this. Um, and in my role as head of growth, obviously for me, I'm, I'm very excited because I, I sit at, the, at kind of the, the entry point of the product and I'm like, whoa, this is super cool. So for those who don't know uh, growth, what that means is growth marketing. Uh, so I acquire customers for Kraken. So I work to acquire, we acquire organic and paid customers. So paid would be via ads and organic would be like SEO. Um, <clears throat> you know, for us, it's, it's scaling. How do we increase the size of our teams X fold? Um, it's how do we build engineering and processes in the back end? you know, whether it be support staff, code, servers, marketing, everything, like how do we scale? How do, we, how do we build that platform for success to scale 10X in a month if we need to, or a week? 
So that's a lot of our thought. Um, a lot of that scaling has to do with hiring. Uh, so we're hiring like crazy at crack. And if you're interested in any role, let me know. Um, happy to make an introduction or say hi to you and let you know what you might be a good fit for. Um, you know, we're just trying to hire across the board. So for Kraken, it's just, you know, how do we, we're going Mach three and how do we go Mach four, right? Like it's, it's kind of, it, it's crazy. You know, it's a little, I gotta be, you gotta admit, you know, if you like to go work at companies that are really big and kind of slow moving, you'll probably lose your mind. But for those who are kind of addicted to that growth and they just love that period of just kind of insanity, but it's like a good kind of insanity, you know, that's the stage that Kraken's at. It's the same feeling I had at Uber. Uh, when Uber was going from, you know, 10 million monthly actives to hundred million, you know, Kraken is, is similarly not, not up to that level, but we're going from millions and we'll be at the end of the cycle, you know, we might be at tens of millions. So I think it's, it's really cool to see this, this progress for Kraken. And then for Bitcoin, what's cr cool about Bitcoin as a store of value asset, all it has to do is remain stable and, and for trust to be woven into it through time by humans. So humans see it's, it's ability to survive. It's still around. The price keeps going higher, more social validation from institutions, more social validation from friends and family. Bitcoin starts to remain a more and more permanent facet of their world. So Bitcoin just has to stay the same. That's all it has to do. It's pretty incredible in terms of execution risk. Bitcoin has the lowest execution risk of any protocol in the space. Um, it will literally su succeed if we just don't mess with it. <laughs> Whereas all the other ones have to try something very aggressive in order to potentially compete with Bitcoin and or potentially compete in other sectors like DeFi or, uh, or, or dApps or something. So, you know, for Bitcoin, I think there, there might be some contention over privacy, maybe later this year, maybe next year. Um, I still think Bitcoin's fine, but you know, there's going to be certain camps that don't like how transparent Bitcoin is and they might push harder for X, Y, Z change. Um, you know, there's a, there's of course a very nuanced argument to the trade-off between fungibility and privacy or sorry, fungibility and auditability. Um, there's, it's sort of a, an either, or sort of, it's a mutually exclusive sort of arrangement. Um, <clears throat> and I don't want to dig into that too deeply, but yeah, Bitcoin just has to stay the same for it to succeed over the next couple of years. And it's very much doing that. Awesome. Um, so you mentioned this important of the price. We have a question that is. If price is all that matters, does that mean Bitcoin price needs to go to infinity or does it need to stabilize and provide a store of value slash hedge against other investments? Yeah, that's a great question. So I often joke, if Bitcoin succeeds, it's going to be really boring, like your grandpa talking about gold. You're like, all right, grandpa, I know you got a gold bar in the basement, but <laughs> that's pretty lame, right? Bitcoin's not going to be cool <laughs> in 20 years. It's going to be your really safe store value asset. <laughs> That's the whole point. You know, this period of really intense price appreciation is along the curve of Bitcoin being globally recognized as a new store of value. The world coming to recognize Bitcoin and accept it and buy into it. This price appreciation is not going to last for forever. Um, you know, certainly we see Bitcoin at a, a later date stabilize in the, you know, 10 to 100 trillion to 200 trillion dollar market cap as it eats other stores of value. Um, Maybe it's a function of like, we have really rapid price appreciation, you know, as we have had in the previous cycles. And then it, you know, at the end, it sort of goes flat or maybe goes up, you know, appreciates one to 2% a year or something as there's a slow trickle of real estate and other store value assets over the next 50 years that start to flow into Bitcoin. We don't know, you know, we don't know how this is going to play out, but what we do know is Bitcoin is relatively um, early in its adoption cycle, which means that there is likely to be a lot more price appreciation and volatility until a later date when a good portion, I don't know what that portion is, but a good portion, a healthy or a sizable portion of the world owns it and it believes in it and it becomes solidified as a gold 2.0. In that moment, it starts to stabilize and become boring and become that, <laughs> that gold in your basement that, you know, most people will likely not hold as much Bitcoin as they do other assets. Um, you know, just like how you don't hold gold typically over to, you have gold as your safe haven asset, your, your store of value, your, uh, kind of emergency, like anti-government money, Bitcoin is the same thing, but it's likely you would, you know, in big, this is Bitcoin 30 years from now, 20 years from now, right. It's likely that most of your assets would be in, in like equities or something else where it's a little bit higher risk, also higher return. And Bitcoin is where you store the money that you don't want to lose. It's your, it's your super store value uh, asset. You, you, indirect, you may have indirectly answered this question, but I want to give you a chance to answer it directly. Never had more people out of the blue ask me about Bitcoin before. Is it still a good time to enter? <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's funny about that, right? Like Bitcoin's at ten thousand dollars for like six months, goes to fifty thousand dollars. I've got the phone ringing off the hook, like, "Hey Dan, should I get in?" I'm like, "Literally, nothing's changed, man. It's the same asset as when it was ten thousand to fifty thousand. But yeah, the price is such a crazy function of that, right? As the price increases, people get FOMO and people become aware of it because then their friends start talking about it, they see it in the news, and then they want to buy it because it's social validation that it is legitimate and it has sticking power. Because when they last heard about it, it was far less worth far less in value. And they're like, oh, crap, I've missed the bull run or like I'm, you know, I feel like, uh, you know, I need to get in before I miss out. That's what's so beautiful about Bitcoin is even if you hate it, <laughs> the game theory behind it is beautiful. If you don't buy it and everyone else buys it, and you're the last one to buy in, then you've had your wealth. You've essentially like <laughs> everyone else's purchasing power has increased other than yours. Um, it's a little like... Um, Roko's Basilisk in a way, <laughs> like a money version of that. Like if you don't buy in earlier, you don't support it, you know, then later on you'll be punished from a purchasing power perspective. Um, but yeah, it, you know, it's still a good time to get in. If you look at the market cap, Bitcoin's market cap is about a trillion dollars. That's tiny. Gold's 10 trillion. Uh, there's negative $18 trillion in sovereign debt, negatively yielding $18 trillion of negatively yielding sovereign debt. Bitcoin has a long ways to go. Uh, fiat money is also 60 trillion. Real estate's in the hundreds of trillions. I don't think things get exciting until Bitcoin. I don't think Bitcoin touches upon its um, value prop of being a gold 2.0 until it's half a thousand dollars, half a million dollars a coin, a million dollars a coin. That's when Bitcoin is legitimate, a legitimate contender, contender for global store of value. You know, at half a million dollars of Bitcoin, I think that's when it's actually price uh, market cap parity with gold. But I think it has far superior characteristics than gold, so it should be much higher than that. Um, so yeah, I'd say it's still early. I felt the same way when I got into 2013, when I started buying Bitcoin around 10 or $100. I thought I was late because all the OGs bought it at a penny and they had huge stacks and I didn't have that big of a stack. So you know, it's never too late to get in. Even when you miss out on Bitcoin's price appreciation, you still have the advantageous nature of the core essence of what, what it is. It's a it's a store value asset that no one else can take away from you and that you can store in your head. You can, you can walk out of a country with it. You can go anywhere you'd like with it. Bitcoin is a Swiss bank account. You know, it, it, it's incredible, right? So even if there's not a huge price appreciation perspective to it of like, okay, like in the next two cycles, so now in 20, you know, um, 2024, like Bitcoin can't go up for infinity. But even when it, even when it doesn't have huge price appreciation, it's still a very, very safe place to store value in. And that's that's the whole reason why we have it. So it's not too early. Um, even if there's not huge price appreciation, which I would find very improbable, you still have all the values of holding Bitcoin, which is it's hard to seize and you can send it anywhere you'd like. Mute. Uh, oh, it looks like we're out of time. So Dan, thank you so much for, for taking your time and, and giving us this presentation and answering a bunch of audience questions. Thank you. Thanks for having me at MIT. I had a blast. Cheers. Awesome. See ya.